Um, my name, um, for those of you who um, have not seen me before, is Professor Joan Lockery, and I'm head of the School of Law, Queen's University, Belfast. And I'm, it's my pleasure tonight to welcome you to the 2024 McDermott Lecture. You are all very welcome. The McDermott family have long been supporters of our school. And tonight we remember Dr. Edith Cunningham, Lord McDermott, who attended this lecture for many years and who were strong supporters of the school. We have this evening once again, um, and we're honoured to have with us members of the McDermott family, Anne McDermott and Anna Louise Shepherd. And on behalf of the School of Law Queens, I'd like to thank you for your support. Thank you. These lectures have become an institution at Queen's, as many of us know, a very special date in our school and our university calendar since the first lecture in 1972. That first lecture, The Decline of the Rule of Law, was delivered by Lord McDermott himself on the 5th of December 1972. And this annual lecture was founded to commemorate his retirement as Lord Chief Justice of Northern Ireland, to acknowledge his service in that role from 1951 to 1971, and his substantial contribution to legal practice, education and research throughout his distinguished career. It embraced academic life, legal practice, politics, judicial office and military service. After service in the First World War, which saw him awarded the Military Cross, he enjoyed a successful academic career alongside a high profile bar practice. He was appointed Attorney General of Northern Ireland before becoming a High Court judge. He was then appointed a Law Lord before returning to Northern Ireland as Lord Chief Justice. He's the only judge to have performed the roles in that order. Here, Queens were rightly proud of his legal legacy as an alumnus and as a former member of staff and as Pro Chancellor. He gave a huge amount to this society. His career was long and exemplary. Um, and he is one of the towering figures of legal life in Northern Ireland. When the lecture series was first established, he said, I feel that these lectures should deal not so much with the law in its technical or academic aspect, but with the impact on the, its impact, sorry, on the prosperity and influence of our nation as a community and on the progress and happiness of its citizens. Those words lie at the heart of what we are as a school of law. We're a school that does have a wider mission in engaging with the wider community. A distinctive part of the school is that it seeks to make a difference to the society it's in, uh, locally, nationally and globally. And law is a cornerstone of the university. It's been taught here for over 175 years. It's part of our heritage, part of the fabric of the university. And the impact and influence of law on all aspects of our society, which Lord McDermott talked about, remains at the heart of teaching and research being carried out here at Queen's. Whether it's examining the powerful and important role of human rights in Northern Ireland, the ongoing consequences of Brexit, or legal implications of new technologies. Our scholars are engaged in cutting edge research, but they are also making a real and impactful difference on society. As many of you will know, our custom in framing this, the occasion is to return to Lord McDermott's terms of reference for the series delivered with characteristic rigour and clarity in the inaugural lecture in 1972. There he said, we know from the history of law and its institutions that the vitality and fortunes of the people are closely linked with the quality of their laws and can ebb and fail if these cease to be effectual or to serve the requirements of the society they purport to rule. And knowing that it is only prudent that we should from time to time scrutinize the health and condition of our principal legal concepts and mark any trend or signal which might injure or imperil the common weal. As we are all aware, current world events demonstrate that Lord McDermott's concern with the rule of law and threats to the rule of law are as relevant today as they were all those years ago. And the talk tonight very much speaks to that, very much is in line with what the lecture series is about. So once again, I want to say welcome to all of you. And at this point, I will now hand over to Professor uh, Aoife O'Donoghue, who's going to introduce our eminent speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, I'm very delighted and pleased to be able to welcome Professor Fiona de Londres to Queen's Law School. Fiona is the Barbara Professor of Jurisprudence 
at Birmingham Law School and also the Director of Research and Knowledge Transfer for the College of Arts and Law. So a leader across all aspects of research. Now, when I uh, came to, to write this introduction, um, I took several different paths. I actually asked ChatGBT, uh, who is Professor Fiona DeLondres? And it was actually surprisingly accurate. Um, but I also, I think I took slight inspiration from uh, this the book cover of my actual notebook and it says some woman for one woman and I think that probably sums up Fiona and her career and her life. Um, we actually met 25 years ago in September in our first week at University College Cork and since that time I've um, watched and admired uh, Fiona's career, um, her approach to research, her approach to being an academic, her approach to a, a researcher as part of political and academic life, and the qualities that sometimes I've frankly wondered at, her commitment to academia, her work ethic, which if anyone who's familiar with her is uh, astounding at times, but always achieved with, I think, a, a real commitment to actual substantive justice and to a feminist care, I think, for her research and her students as well. For any, anyone, um, you just have to look at the amazing careers of her PhD students to understand just how much effort and time and the time that she gives to other people, her students, her colleagues, and, uh, and her role at, at uh, faculty level to a whole range of people across many different disciplines. Um, she is always busy, but she always has time. And I think that's one of the most important qualities that she has. Now, she her work is extremely well known. She's very well known as um, an expert in counterterrorism law. She, her book, uh, Counterterrorism and Practice Problems of Transnational Counterterrorism, I re highly recommend to everybody. It is a quite terrifying book in reality. Um, but if you want to know how law is made in the 21st century, I think it is quite eye opening and, and probably feeds into what she's going to say today. Of course, she's also well known for her work on uh, reproductive justice and particularly in the repeal the eighth campaign in which she featured quite strongly and heavily and was an important part. Um, she also has an extensive record uh, of writing and publishing on ECHR rights, um, including her book with uh, Constantin Desatu, I'm going to apologize to him, who's also a PhD student of Fiona's and now a professor himself, um, on the great debates on ECHR rights. ECHR rights. Um, she's also worked quite recently on COVID-19 and her COVID-19 review observatory, which looked to record, track, and assess the responses to COVID-19 across all four parliaments within the United Kingdom is an exemplar of real-time research on an extremely important matter, recording exactly what legal changes were brought in, particularly through statutory instruments, ensuring there was transparency, accountability, and legitimacy, and questioning when there wasn't. And very important in those moments of emergency when we are faced with very difficult questions and governments are faced with very difficult questions that we too as lawyers take seriously our role in monitoring and ensuring and speaking out when we think that there may be issues. Now we have had many, many academic and not so academic adventures over the years, but I'm very, very proud um, to call Fiona a friend, uh, a fellow academic, and I am only delighted to introduce her to you all this afternoon. Thank you very much, Aoife and Joan, and thank you all for being here this evening. I would, of course, like to start by thanking Professor Lockery, the school and the McDermott family for honouring me with the invitation to uh, be the lecturer for the series um, in this year and to uh, acknowledge, as Joan did, Anna Louise Shepherd and Anne McDermott, both of whom are with us this evening, and the memory of Dr Edith Cunningham, um, uh, and of course, Lord McDermott, in whose memory the lecture series is named. Um, as well as the considerable professional honour that the school has paid me by inviting me to give this lecture, there are two personal reasons why I'm very happy to be here this evening, uh, which I hope you'll indulge me in uh, very briefly. The first is, uh, I think Aoife has effectively stolen my thunder. It is to be introduced by my great friend uh, Aoife, 
O'Donoghue, uh, I, I won't be as effusive in my praise of her, but merely for the purposes of time uh, rather than any other reason. Um, and the second is that this is my first public lecture as the Lady Barber Professor of Jurisprudence. Uh, and I'm delighted to be able to speak under her name for the first time at home here uh, in Ireland. Taking their cue from the 1957 Hamlin Lectures that Lord McDermott delivered, entitled Protection from Power, as well as the inaugural lecture of this series, uh, these lectures have, as Joan already said, traditionally attended to rule of law concerns. Uh, this evening's lecture, which is now considerably more timely than it was when I wrote it, uh, is no different. Over the course of the next 40 minutes or thereabouts, I want to draw together a number of threads uh, from my work on constitutionalism in Westminster, on the European Convention on Human Rights, and on what uh, I have termed constitutionalist dispositions, to ask whether what I perceive to be a significant and cons consistent dispositional turn away from constitutionalism in Whitehall and Westminster might be understood not merely as an outworking of politics per se, but as an indication of democratic decay. In the time available to me, I limit myself to examining two manifestations of this counter-constitutionalist turn, sovereignism and excessive delegation. I will argue that both can be understood as indications of democratic decay when we see them within the framework of the United Kingdom's constitutional structure, although neither have been so named by either the European Court of Human Rights or as a general matter by public law scholars um, taken sort of in, as a broad group. Both, I will suggest near the end, are arrestable by a government and a parliament that recommits to their role as constitutional guardians. Let me start then with some thoughts on democratic decay. Um, the UK is consistently ranked highly in the major democracy indices, such as VDEM, Polity 5, and the Global State of Democracy Index. All of these focus for their assessment on the health of democracy on major or flagship democratic institutions, particularly judicial independence, free and fair elections, the independence of the media, parliamentary control of government, civil society, and electoral representativeness. Even when within those indices, some concerns or causes for concern are identified in respect of the United Kingdom, such as uh, obstruction of civil society, which the Civicus Monitor identified in 2023, or surveillance and strict libel laws identified by the Economic Intelligence Unit in 2022, they are generally not understood or presented as red flags about democratic decay per se. The UK, in other words, is generally considered a robust consolidated democracy with a firm and well-established commitment to the rule of law. No doubt this partly reflects how democratic decay is generally conceptualized in the capacious literature on it from law, political science, democracy studies, and sociology. Within that literature, consolidated democracies generally receive less attention than emerging, transitional, or receding democracies. A similar trend is identifiable when we look at the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights in as much as it relates to democratic decay. The court has always affirmed that profound belief in the rule of law, as they called it in Golder against the United Kingdom, <clears throat> is one of the reasons why member states of the Council of Europe introduced collective enforcement of human rights through the convention, and that the rule of law and protection of democracy are inherent in all of the convention's articles. In recent years, the court has been particularly vigilant about erosions of judicial independence and identifying those as indications of democratic decay. As colleagues will no doubt know, they found violations of Article 6 in cases like Zurich and Poland in 2022, 
in which a domestic court judge was removed from office before the end of his tenure, having criticized proposed changes to the organization of the Polish judiciary, and in Emin Nagauglu against Turkey in 2021, when a judge who had criticized government policy was moved to a considerably inferior judicial posting without process, review, or appeal. Alongside that, the European Court of Human Rights has also greatly developed its jurisprudence on Article 18, which prohibits states from restricting convention rights for any purpose other than those for which they have been prescribed. Even though it is quite rare for the court to find a violation of Article 18, its connection with contemporary attempts to prevent or repress democratic backsliding is visible in some recent case law. For example, in Demiratis against Turkey, number two, the court found a violation of Article 5 in conjunction with Article 18, where the applicant, an active opposition politician, was stripped of parliamentary immunity and placed in pretrial detention on terrorist charges following pro kurdish speeches given in Parliament, organising and attendance at meetings. This was part of a pattern targeting opposition and dissenting politicians that coincided in time with a constitutional referendum and presidential election, and that the court found was being pursued with the ulterior motive of stifling pluralism and limiting freedom of debate and democracy. Similarly, in a well-known series of cases against Azerbaijan, including the Mamam Mamamadov case, the court identified a pattern of retaliatory prosecution and associated arrest and detention of critics, human rights defenders and activists, resulting in a finding that Article 18 had been violated. It is perhaps tempting to think that because we don't see all out attacks on core rule of law institutions in the United Kingdom of the kind that this case law seeks to address, there is no democratic decay with which we need to be concerned. However, I suggest it's useful to think not only about effect or the red flag indicators, but also about cause when we seek to understand what it is that we are observing. In this, I'm influenced by Johannes Gershevsky's suggestion that there is some value in distinguishing between democratic erosion and democratic decay. Gershevsky claims that while decay is endogenously caused, erosion is an exogenously driven process, so that it is critical that we clarify in the first place where the causal driver for democratic regression is actually located. If it is what he would call exogenous, what is being witnessed is mere erosion, a kind of constitutional wear and tear, whereas endogenously originated decline is properly understood as decay, that is, as something that indicates a significant decline in democratic quality, the arrest of which requires an intervention. I contend that when we place contemporary trends into their constitutional context, there is an argument for understanding their cause as being a counter-constitutionalist dispositional turn among recent and indeed not so recent executives that taking the structures and principles of the UK constitution into account should be understood and addressed not as mere erosion or political expediency, but as a significant constitutional rule of law and democratic challenge. I'm just going to get a drink of water while I think about the next bit. You will all be pleased, I think, to hear that we don't have time to canvas the enormous literature debating, disputing, theorizing, and re-theorizing constitutionalism in the United Kingdom. It is sufficient, I think, for us to lean on Joe Merkin's formative article from 2009, The Quest for Constitutionalism in UK Public Law Discourse. In that, Merkin's identified three different ways in which constitutionalism tends to be used in UK constitutional and public law discourse. First, as a way of conceptualizing the UK's constitutional order in the absence of a clear constitutional theory. Second, as a way of articulating the importance of a constitutionally oriented way of governing accountable to Parliament 
in the absence of a unitary constitutional document, and third, as an umbrella term to cover how the constitution works when we consider the relationship between parliament, the government, the courts, and core constitutional principles like the rule of law, accountability to parliament, and legality. In a recent piece of work emanating from the COVID-19 review observatory, which Aoife mentioned, myself and my co-authors, Pablo Hidalgo and Dan Daniela Locke, sought to capture these three ways of thinking about constitutionalism in reference or by reference to a constitutionalist mindset. By this, we mean a disposition on the part of government primarily, but also parliamentarians, to uphold constitutional principle out of normative adherence to that principle, and not merely because politics or parliamentary arithmetic forces them to do so. As we put it in that piece, the constitutional principles of parliamentary sovereignty and accountability to parliament depend to a large extent for their effectiveness on the willingness of the executive to submit to parliamentary scrutiny, not to treat parliament as a mere adjunct of the government and to exercise power in a manner compatible with the, with the ability of parliament to carry out its constitutional functions. We rely for this on the proposition that the executive, MPs, and devolved governments and legislatures will manifest a disposition to exercise discretionary power in a manner that respects UK constitutional principles, even when arithmetic circumstance and procedure do not strictly require them to do so. In particular, this implicates exercising powers in a way that respects parliamentary sovereignty, parliamentary accountability, the separation of powers, the rule of law, the principle of legality and the use of powers in the public rather than political interest. In this, of course, we were echoing what theorists have long argued in the literature. Take, for example, Bogdanor's canonical politics and the constitution from 1996, in which he points out that the peculiarity of the British constitution is that it lacks an umpire. It is the players themselves the government of the day who interpret the way in which the rules are to be applied. In other words, within the United Kingdom's constitution, constitutionalism is politically secured. Parliamentary politics then are more than mere politics. They are the constitution in action. I will now look at just two examples to seek to illustrate that contemporary constitutional activity suggests regression and points towards democratic decay. And those are sovereignism and excessive reliance on delegation. For the purposes of our conversation this evening, when I speak about sovereignism, I'm referring to an approach that treats law as malleable to the will of the executive. So that the sense of being bound by law, being limited in what is and is not possible recedes significantly. Of course, the notion of law as something that binds every institution, authority, and person is a central tenet of the rule of law. It is also something that, at least to an outsider to the UK's constitution, like me, initially sits uneasily alongside the principle of parliamentary sovereignty and the ways in which the UK's constitution function. In the very crudest of terms, one might ask, how can law limit Parliament if Parliament can make any law that it wants? We know, of course, that that's not quite how it works. It's a simplification. There are limitations on Parliament, and they are rooted in Parliament's own decision-making and legislative activity, even if sometimes Parliament appears somewhat surprised by the meaning and implications of its decisions and certainly less cognizant of them than basic constitutional literacy might have led us to expect. But leaving that to one side, the basic structure of the UK's constitution suggests that this fundamental idea of the rule of law might manifest a little differently in the United Kingdom to how we might observe it in a system of separated and equal powers, or even of constitutional supremacy where courts have strike down capacity and legislatures are manifestly and strictly constrained by hard to amend constitutional law. Even taking that into account though, it is possible to identify sovereigntist approaches when we look beyond structures and into motivation, or again, what Gershevsky might call cause. 
I think this might be most evident when we think about attitudes towards international law, compliance with which is one of Lord Bingham's well-known eight central principles of the rule of law. More than 20 years ago now, Peter Spiro wrote about the emergence of what he called new sovereignism in the United States. He identified this in the work of a group of scholars and intellectuals who were not opposed to international law per se, but who thought that the United States should be able to engage with it as and when it wanted to. In other words, these scholars promoted an a la carte approach to international law, underpinned by what he called a brand of anti-internationalism that runs deep in the American political tradition. Inevitably, sovereignism would look a little bit different in the United Kingdom, but the basic proposition is the same. The state is sovereign and therefore can decide for itself what international law to follow and what to resist, whether it is binding or it is not, as and when best serves its purpose. Current debates about the UK's relationship to the European Convention on Human Rights are exemplary of this. In his outstanding work on the history of the European Convention on Human Rights, Ed Bates noted that when the UK signed up to the convention, it did so fully in the expectation that it would rarely, if ever, find itself in contravention of it. In this, of course, it was hardly alone. Few states that signed up to the convention, particularly in its very early iterations, could have anticipated how it would develop over time or that they would find themselves on the receiving end of adverse judgments from a permanent court in Strasbourg. However, inevitably, like most legal systems, over the decades the convention has evolved into a significant international treaty with substantial enforcement mechanisms and a permanent court with the power to hand down adverse judgments binding on respondent states. Of course, this is tempered by the court's commitment to subsidiarity and how the court has developed the principle of subsidiarity over the years. Although it didn't receive express articulation in the convention text until Protocol 15, Subsidiarity has always been a principle of the European Convention on Human Rights. Now usually framed through the language of shared responsibility between Strasbourg and the uh, contracting parties, subsidiarity reflects the notion that responsibility for compliance and implementation of the convention is shared between national and European authorities and that indeed national institutions bear the primary responsibility for rights protection. This way of thinking about sub subsidiarity has both practical and normative underpinnings. On a practical level, which we won't dwell on, any other approach would overload the court in terms of workload. On a normative level, there are two interesting normative concerns that motivate this. The first is the claim and uh, is the claim that the national authorities have a better grasp of realities on the ground and are in principle more directly accountable to people than the Strasbourg court so that their judgment as to whether any interference with the convention right is a permitted limitation on that right should be given at least some weight in the court's decision on that question. Secondly, is the normative principle that subsidiarity enhances legitimacy vis-a-vis -vis the contracting parties, not least because it demonstrates judicial self-restraint in Strasbourg and a willingness not to substitute the conclusions of an allegedly unaccountable remote international court for that of an allegedly accountable proximate national body about a question on which there could be reasonable disagreement. As with the rest of the convention and its operation, subsidiarity is further underpinned by the clear assumption that contracting parties engage with the convention in good faith and share a common vision for its enforcement and for what has become known as a European public order based on a common core minimum protection of rights. The court's fairly recent commitment to what it calls process-based review exemplifies its approach to subsidiarity now. Process-based review refers to the, Stras to the Strasbourg Court's practice of relying on the quality of national decision-making in the review of justifications for interference with convention rights. If convention principles have adequately been taken into account in domestic decision-making, 
it is generally considered that the convention is effectively embedded and was given appropriate weight so that Strasbourg will afford significant deference to domestic authorities' views on convention compatibility. In other words, the decision as to whether there has been a substantive violation of convention rights would be informed, sometimes substantially, by whether the convention played a part in decision-making processes at the domestic level, including whether domestic courts and parliaments considered it when assessing the matter in respect of which an application has been made. According to Robert Spano, the former president of the court, this represents a shift of the court's primary methodological focus from its own independent assessment of the conventionality of the domestic measure towards an examination of whether the issue has been properly analyzed by the domestic decision maker in conformity with embedded principles and obligations under the convention. Importantly for my purposes, process-based review brings into very sharp focus parliamentary engagement with the convention, underlining in supranational adjudication what we all know in national constitutional arrangements, namely that serious engagement with human rights by legislatures is both critical to effective rights protection and appropriately reflective of the roles and responsibilities of legislatures within national constitutional structures. Why do I go off on this tangent? Well, because to a substantial extent, innovations like process-based review in the Strasbourg court have been developed in response to critiques from the United Kingdom of alleged overreach by the European Court of Human Rights. This development has also exacerbated what Bashak Chali has called the variable geometry of human rights protection with domestic processes of states that are not considered to be in need of close international supervision, benefiting from heavy presumptions of legitimacy about the quality of their engagement with rights. Spano again suggested that closer supervision may still be required in some cases, which he defined as states that do not respect the rule of law, do not ensure the impartiality and independence of their judicial systems, oppress political opponents, or mask prejudice and hostility towards vulnerable groups or minorities. Here again, in Spano's intervention, we see the red flags for democratic backsliding and can infer a lighter touch approach for countries, including the United Kingdom, where these red flags are happily not manifestly in evidence. Given all of this, what meaning might we make of the UK government's continued hostility towards the European Court of Human Rights, a court that has evolved its jurisprudence and indeed the text of its protocols to respond directly to the United Kingdom's concerns, a court that in truth makes vanishingly few adverse decisions against the United Kingdom, a court that shows considerable, some would argue excessive deference to the judgments and processes of the Westminster Parliament. For me, at least, it is difficult not to see within this hostility towards the court, a kind of new sovereigntist reasoning that goes to the heart of the rule of law. If the rule of law stands for the proposition that law is law and must be complied with, that one's position of power cannot exempt one from the application of law, and that this is equally applicable to international law and national law, concern must surely arise. This is perhaps even more the case when one recognizes in the rhetorical scaffolding of much of the arguments made in the United Kingdom against the court and convention, classical counter-constitutionalist tropes, that this is being done to pursue the will of the people, populism, that rights endanger security, exceptionalism, and that the state is resisting law to enhance democratic institutions, cynical democratism. Critically, what I perceive to be the underpinning logic of anti-ECHO rhetoric, that is resistance to any entity other than parliament determining what is or is not legally permissible or acceptable in the United Kingdom, is showing also in domestic manifestations of sovereigntism, whether it is in the extraordinary ouster clause contained in the Safety of Rwanda Asylum and Immigration Act of 2024, 
or political flourishes in response to judicial decisions, including some recent decisions from this jurisdiction, that there is no lack of evidence of increasing counter-constitutionist disposition in Whitehall. Or what Stuart Wallace yesterday described on the Constitutional Society's blog as sophistry and sheer executive chutzpah to push through policy preferences regardless of international obligation or domestic constitutional principle. That chutzpah, to stick with Wallace's phrase, is evident not only in the spectacles of new sovereigntist tussles with Strasbourg or populist tropes to stop the boats or similar, but also in seemingly quotidian, often technical, but constitutionally significant pieces of business, including recourse to delegated lawmaking. Delegated legislation has caused constitutional anxiety across jurisdictions for decades. Even while conceding that it is indispensable to effective governance, especially in situations requiring rapid or highly technical responses, scholars, parliamentarians and courts have long accepted that delegated legislation is a deviation from the alleged paradigm of lawmaking in parliamentary democracies, that is primary legislation. In the United Kingdom, the challenge that delegated legislation poses to the cardinal principle of parliamentary sovereignty has been purportedly answered through what me and my co-authors recently termed the constitutional bargain of delegated lawmaking. Building on almost a decade of parliamentary committees concern with delegation, we argued that this has three elements. The proper limitation of delegation by Parliament through well-designed parent legislation and, of course, eschewing skeleton bills, which are very common. The exercise of self-restraint by the executive in the use of delegated authority, not only to avoid acting ultra vires, but also to be normatively restrained in their delegated powers and the enablement of meaningful scrutiny by Parliament. In our analysis, we used a sample of the secondary instruments applying to England and introduced by the UK government as part of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic as a lens to explore some broader dynamics of delegation. The sample comprised 81 COVID-related regulations made over the course of a year. Um, they were chosen on the basis that they were subject to parliamentary debate in the first year of the pandemic. There were many more regulations than that, but these were the ones that were debated between March 2020 and March 2021. In the same period, 330 other COVID-19 related regulations were passed subject to the negative procedure. In other words, not debated. The total of 415 COVID related regulations passed that year formed about a third of the 1,206 statutory instruments made in that 12 month period. In carrying out our analysis, we assessed many features of the regulations, which I won't detain you with, but they included whether and when they came into force in relation to when they were debated by Parliament. What part or parts of Parliament debated them and which parent act they were introduced under. This revealed that 71 of the 81 regulations we looked at in depth were already in force by the time they were debated by any part of Parliament. Across the House of Lords, the Delegated Legislation Committee, and to a very limited degree, the House of Commons, about 54 hours of parliamentary time was devoted in that year to SIs that were already in force, and indeed some of which had already gone out of force. Many of those statutory instruments imposed significant restrictions on everyday life, and some of them carried uh, criminal implications for their breach. This was not unique. This is not unique to the pandemic, that there would be a lot of delegation and that often SIs would be enforced before Parliament considers them. We have seen it also in respect of Brexit, in which there is excessive delegation also in evidence. But it's also not unique just to these slightly aberrational or intensive phenomena like a pandemic or Brexit. Over the last few years, the Hansard Society has done remarkable work on delegation, finding that the division between what belongs in primary legislation 
and what belongs in delegated legislation or the perception thereof has shifted considerably and now, as they say, pushes the boundaries of what constitutes an appropriate delegation of power. They have also found that parliamentary processes for scrutiny have not kept pace with the changing nature of delegation, so that parliamentary scrutiny rarely provides a satisfactory forum for members to express concerns about these laws that directly affect citizens. Importantly, and I think correctly, the Hansard Society outlines the decades-long provenance of these changes, noting that administrations of all political persuasions have endorsed a drift towards pursuing and addressing principal matters of policy in delegated rather than primary legislation, and that successive parliaments have acquiesced in this marginalization of their role. Building on all of this, I suggest that excessive reliance on delegated legislation can be understood as indicating democratic decay in at least three ways. First, as I've intimated, it inevitably marginalizes parliament and suggests a government unwilling to subject itself to parliament's judgment and to the possibility of defeat, thus undermining a core democratic institution within the UK's constitutional infrastructure. This is perhaps especially clear when we think about the proliferation of Henry VIII clauses over the last decade. Henry VIII clauses enable primary legislation to be amended or repealed by subordinate legislation with or without further scrutiny by parliament. Having been used only nine times between 1888 and 1929, they are now more or less commonplace in marquee pieces of legislation. And they have been described as one of the most egregious forms of inappropriate use of secondary legislation in a recent commission chaired by Dominic Grieve. That these have become almost commonplace in the practice of governments that have enjoyed an enormous parliamentary majority just reinforces the depth of the challenge that they indicate. Second, Excessive delegation sets up inevitable clashes with courts. Courts are left as the constitutional guardians in the absence of effective parliamentary supervision, engagement and scrutiny. And they are left in that position in a context in which there appears to be a clear tendency towards political rhetoric that constructs courts and by extension law as obstacles, obstacles to policy pursuit and such obstacles as per se undesirable rather than proper manifestations of the rule of law. While classical attacks on judicial independence, like we saw in the cases I referred to from the Strasbourg court earlier, are not present in the United Kingdom, the politicization of judicial decision-making and vilification of courts hardly suggests rude democratic health. Third, Excessive delegation manifests a turn away from constitutionalist mindset by marginalizing parliament, even where the government has the capacity more or less to guarantee safe passage for its legislative agenda because it enjoys a large parliamentary majority. This then communicates a disregard not only for substantive, but even for procedural constitutionalism. The breakdown of the constitutional bargain that at least in principle under, underpins delegated lawmaking is an exposition rather than a source of executive dominance and parliamentary marginalization and an illustration of that its corrosive effects on the core tenets of the UK constitution. So where does all this leave us? Uh, mercifully close to the end, uh, I will assure you. The 2023 Constitution Unit survey showed that 78% of respondents considered that healthy democracy requires that politicians always act within the rules. I read that sentiment as pointing towards a desire for politics to proceed not only ethically and honestly, but also in a way that respects the constitutional structure that provides the scaffolding for a healthy democracy. While it may be tempting to suggest that the concerns I've outlined so far can be explained by mere politics 
or even by a lack of constitutionalist commitment by particular politicians holding high office in recent governments. Simply putting this all down to bad politics risks us missing trends that might better alert us to significant and concerning democratic decay. If that is right, the question is, what do we do about it? The European Court of Human Rights is not the answer, both because of the hostility any attempt to intervene by that court would no doubt attract, but also because the court's jurisprudence has evolved in a way that seeks to avoid conflict with consolidated democracies like the United Kingdom and appears to have developed a very high threshold for what it will identify as democracy endangering violations of rights. But even if that were not the case, acknowledging the endogenous or internal explanations for contemporary democratic decay points us towards the need for a solution that comes from inside the system. Writing about the ongoing attempts to restore democracy in Poland, John Mortin has noted that restoring a damaged liberal democracy requires a different mindset than fighting its demise one must constructively rebuild. Importantly, he reminds us that the infuriating reality is that entrenchment has occurred and cannot be easily undone overnight, except through draconian measures that may themselves be in strong tension with the rule of law that needs saving. Most urgently in that context, the new Polish government cannot simply fire the political appointees to the judiciary of the previous administration, and replace them, they must rebuild in a constitutionalist manner, even if that means accepting that some things cannot immediately be resolved. The challenge of arresting democratic decline and recommitting to the rule of law that I perceive to face any new government and parliament in the United Kingdom is not the same as the challenge that the contemporary Polish government faces. But there is much that we can learn from the thoughtful distinction that lawyers, politicians, and civil servants in Poland are making between re-democratization and fighting democratic backsliding. They are showing us in real time that re-democratization requires express, careful, and sometimes imperfect recommitment to the rule of law and to what I am deeming that constitutionalist disposition or mindset. It may well be then that the signs of a recommitment to constitutionalism, democracy and the rule of law will not only or perhaps even mainly be in policy reversals, repeal of controversial laws, removal of controversial appointees, eradication of franchise living, limiting uh, initiatives like voter ID requirements. Perhaps instead, evidence of a recommitment to constitutionalism and the arrest of democratic decline will lie in less spectacular, more technical, and sometimes even banal actions, like eschewing legislative shortcuts, such as Henry VIII powers, moving away from the excessive use of skeleton bills, putting policy back into primary legislation, de-escalating tensions with international human rights bodies, exhibiting constitutional humility before Parliament, removing and resisting the temptation to introduce new ouster clauses and reaffirming the status of international law as law. All of this is not only a little bit boring, but also considerably harder than it sounds. It requires government to take the long way around, sometimes at the expense of policy preferences, political support and popularity among its electoral base to seek to avoid inter-institutional clashes with domestic and international courts that can serve important political ends. It requires something more than headlines. It is, however, no more than what is needed if what I perceive to be a current democratic decline is not to become grave in the next government and parliament. Thank you. <laughs>